It's been a little while since we've taken a look at any of the projects out of the Master Mirror find, and I thought today maybe we would get back into this. And I was thinking about one of the adzes in here, and more specifically, this smaller adz right here. I thought that looked like a nice, simple adz. So I think we'll take a look at doing that. It's shown in a little bit better detail here on plate 26 in the book with some cross-sectional drawings. And this is at a scale of one to two, so we need to make it twice the size that it's shown in the book. One of the easiest ways to scale things like this is just with a pair of dividers. So we can set our dividers and see if we can figure out what the, the base stock size is here. So we measure that and then we can just go to our ruler and that's three-eighths of an inch, so that means double that is going to be three-quarters of an inch, or about 20 millimeters if you're in metric. I'm sure the Viking Smiths didn't care what the sizes were that much. They used the material they had in whatever size they had and made the appropriate tool, and if it was a little bigger, a little smaller, probably wasn't that big a deal. Now, if I look at the shape of the eye and I measure the eye out, what I find out is that it is pretty much exactly the size and shape of this thing that we made earlier that they have labeled in the book as an anvil. And I never really thought this was much of an anvil. It may serve as some small light duty anvil. But I think this is a drift and it's exactly the size and shape of the eye in this ad. So it very well could have been the tool used to make that. And that's exactly the tool I'm gonna to use to shape that eye. Now these tools would have been made in wrought iron, and today I'm going to go ahead and use wrought iron. So a punched eye in wrought iron is not very strong because of how short this is right through here, and the grain structure of the wrought iron, that's gonna split. The odds of that surviving in long-term use are very slim, and I doubt that they were made that way. So I think the way to do this is an asymmetric eye, where you set it up pretty much just like the bow tie weld, except it's all off to one side, and the weld ends up right in here somewhere. So when you spread this blade, so when you spread this blade, you're not stressing the weld as much, because it's up in here where you're gonna do less work, and down here is all the original material. Now in wrought iron, it's all full of forge welds and seams anyway, so that might not make much difference. But I think that's the way I'm going to go, use that asymmetric eye, and we can kind of look at how that's set up. And to do all this, I've got an old piece of wrought iron. This is something that I got from somebody out of state. I have no idea what it originates from or anything else. It hasn't been the high, highest quality stuff, and I suppose I should re-weld it and laminate it a few more times and refine it some more. But we're going to see how it does for this like this. And it's about an inch and an eighth diameter. I'm going to reduce this to that three quarter inch size that the original shows before I start work. So I'm going to cut a piece of this off, turn it into a rectangular bar, and then we're going to start working on the eye. But that means it's time to light a fire and get to work. The round bar was cut three and a half inches long, forges out to about four and a half inches long, is about an inch by three quarter. I'm not trying to make exact reproductions, I'm being inspired by the Master Mirror find and trying to make tools that are of that style, but they don't have to be exact when I'm done. Because I want this asymmetric, I've shifted everything over, and that first line is an inch and a half from the edge here then three quarters, and from that center mark, the center of that space there, I've come over here and I've gone two inches 
from there. So an inch either side of that center mark, and I'm going to put some center punch marks in here so I can find it again hot. And these will all be obliterated before we're done forging, so they're not going to show in the finished product. I will then use a skinny fuller to come in at those marks and fuller down and then we'll draw out in between the marks and that'll make more sense when we get to that. This is quite easy under the power hammer with just a quarter inch round rod. But I thought I would do most of this by hand at the anvil. Now that we've got a nice bar established. I think these could have been spread further apart here because my pole is going to be way too skinny there. I'm going to have to do some extra work on it. I think that will do for that. Next thing I want to do is I want to put a little bit of a bevel on this end piece here so that that forms our scarf when we wrap this around. And I'm going to bevel from the side that has the pole, not the side that will be the inside of the eye. And this is just a short bevel that comes to a point. Nothing fancy. And that will help us blend when we do our weld. Now I want to thin the section between this fuller and this fuller, and that will form one side of the eye, and this will be the other side of the eye. We'll do that just by putting the fuller over the edge of the anvil. I'm forging down that one from there and this one from here. And you can start drawing out some little ears if you want ears on your ads. And the original does show ears on the bottom side only. And which side's the bottom doesn't make a bit of difference until you put the ear on there. No big forging here, I'm just trying to smooth that out a little bit. I'm going to turn it around to do the, the other side exactly the same way. Now those don't look perfectly symmetrical to me. So what I do is I take a pair of dividers and I measure one and then the other one, this one needs to go about a quarter inch further. So I'll turn it around and stretch it out a little further. It's also just a little bit thicker through here I think. So got plenty of material to work with. And if you need to you can draw it out with a peen a little bit. Better to do this on the inside though, 
so it doesn't show on the outside. And just use the flat of the hammer on the outside. See a little bit of a delamination inside that eye that I don't like, but hopefully it won't hurt anything. It's a little bit right there at the edge of the cross peen. Yep, that's going to crack all the way across. I hate this old rod iron. So there's a little, little bit of a crack forming here, and it looks like it may telescope all the way out to here. And this source of wrought iron just gives me nothing but frustration. It's a lot closer to the right size though. I'm going to go ahead and fold this up. I'm pretty sure it's not going to like it. but Yep, broke right off. And this kind of shows you how this is going to fold and break. Now that is the downside of working with old wrought iron. I have no idea what the history of this is, if it was severely abused in use, if it was just lousy wrought iron to start with. Talking to people like Peter Ross, he says that it often has to do with just the chemical composition of the wrought iron. And some of the stuff that was more utilitarian just didn't have the refinement that you need for this kind of work. I have another piece cut. I'm going to go ahead and bring it up to this same point, and I'll meet you right back here when I get it to that stage. And we will see if we can go ahead and get this done out of wrought iron. If I can't, then I'll switch to mild steel, and we'll start right back here with the mild steel. But I'll let you know which one I decided to do in just a few seconds. Okay, after a quick break, I've taken the time to forge another blank for this. And this one looks a lot better. I don't see any serious problems with it. It does have just a little bit of delamination right through here. It's the same wrought iron, hasn't had anything else done to it other than just reforge the blank. But I think it's going to be okay. We're going to fold it up and find out. I put the long section down in the fire because it needs to move the most. And that way we should be able to get our eye. Now that eye is a lot bigger than I envisioned it being. So I have way more material than I need here, I think, but we're going we're gonna to finish it and see what it looks like. I'm going to get some flux way down in the joint there. I also notice that my scarf section is wider, so we're just going to have to try and forge that in as we do the weld. Should have taken the time to measure that. Now we want to bring that up to welding heat. Remember, this side is going to heat slower than this side, so start with that down, but you may still need to turn it on the fire some. Remember, wrought iron welds at a much higher heat than mild steel, so this is where you want that lemon yellow color. Light quick blows. I'm going to start forging that down. Just a touch more flux to make sure that everything's good, but feels like a good solid weld so far. Back in the fire. This is why I like to make my tongs out of mild steel. These got red hot, but I can't quench them because these are commercially made and they're some kind of an alloy, so they will get brittle if I quench them. So I'm gonna have to find a different pair of tongs so these cool down. No reason to keep working after it uh, starts to drop below welding heat, or at least not on the weld. It's a good time to start refining some of this outer shape here. And I'm going to start drawing this down. But if it gets a little bit too cold, I'm going to quit. So the last thing I want to do is shear my weld. But I think the weld itself is good. I think the next thing to do here is going to be to 
try to clean up that eye a little bit. So we'll turn it back around. We'll put the drift in and see what we ended up with. I'm going to start just by cleaning up the back where the pole is a little bit. And it's kind of crooked, so we're going to have to draw out this other side, which is okay because it looks a little bit thick. I want to drive that in too far because you could shear the weld if it's not as good a weld as you might like. But you kind of get the idea there. I'll do that some more and keep drawing this side out. I'll probably go to the peen of the hammer the next heat and put the drift in from the other side. Also, if I heat this with that eye down, it'll be hotter and it will move more than the other one. It's getting a lot better. We still need to keep drawing this side out a little bit more, it looks like. Hopefully that uh, drift, or anvil as they called it, will finish the job. If not, I'll have to go to something bigger. I'm alternating which side I put the drift in each heat. I think that's where I'm going to quit, at least for now. It's a hard thing to hold on to there. Now the original, this is pretty much square on the end and it's got a fuller mark, so I think we'll do that before we turn this around. I'm going to start by reducing this in size. Also makes our pole much bigger than it was so we may not have needed to leave as much material as we did initially beginning to think maybe starting with half inch thick bar might have been sufficient that's much closer to that square dimension that I see in the book so we're going to put that fuller mark in there That'll definitely need to be redrifted again after that. But just lightly for now, I'm going to do a final drifting when this is completely finished and the blade is done. So that'll do for now. Now we're going to turn it around and we're going to work on this other end. And hope I can get a long enough blade out of it. And for that I'm going to switch to this four pound double diagonal peen so I can use it as a drawing hammer this way. The other way it spreads and we may end up using that if we need to spread the blade. But to start with I just want to draw it out. I mostly want to make this longer but I'm also going to let it start to spread. And we may have to spread it intentionally here in a little bit. Because it isn't spreading very far, so we'll go to the other side of this. Now you can see where my original weld is coming out there. And I've got just a little bit of it opening up, so I'm going to re-weld that. Not very much of it is opening, but just that little tiny bit.
And it looks like it sealed down pretty well. So that's all we're going to do for right now. I think the next thing is to put our cutting edge in. And I'm going to use a piece of W1 for that. So first thing I want to do is draw out a taper this way and bring it to a, a sharp edge for the scarf. That is way more than I need, but we can cut it. Yeah, that's not the hammer I want. There, it gives me a mark I can find again. This is a little bit too big, so I'll do some trimming on it after we get the initial weld done. But before I worry about welding, I'm going to clean out my fire a little bit. A nice clean fire is critical to forge welding. And my coal tends to be pretty dirty, so I want to get these clinkers out. There's a big one there. Clinkers, all the impurities, the flux, the scale off your iron, dirt, and other junk that comes with the coal, which is part of the problem with this coal. But just getting that one big one out is going to make this fire burn hotter and cleaner. I'm going to go ahead and heat up the ads head. Looks like my camera battery went dead for this next segment. So we're just gonna look at the second camera that does not have as good of audio. Sorry about that, but that's the way things go when you got a blacksmith running the camera. I can balance this in the fire and not drop that off of there. This is the way the old guys would have done it. A much more difficult thing than putting that little tack weld in. I don't guarantee I'll get away with it. If I lose that cutting edge, I'll go to the tack weld. Out gently. And give it just enough to make sure it's stuck. It seems to be stuck. flux and then we'll get a little bit more serious about it and once it's good and welded I'll come back and I'll trim that junk off the edge there I yeah, got that W1 a little bit hot you see where it crumbled there at the edge so that's all going to have to be trimmed off as well that's a That's always a risk with different kinds of materials, but I can trim all that burned stuff off and it's not going to hurt us any. So we'll take a minute and trim this. And that other side doesn't need much trimming. It ended up getting worked in pretty well. Just a little bit there, and I think we'll have it. It also grind all that junk off of there. Now looking at this, this is a lot wider than I think the original is. I think it's narrower through here, so we can draw out some in that dimension and pull this blade out a little longer. It's still plenty thick through here, so we can pull some more out there. We're going to do that stuff next, and we'll do it at a welding heat so we keep refining our welds as we do this without burning up our cutting edge anymore. I'm going to go back to this diagonal peen because it'll have a similar curve profile to the horn, 
and that way I should be able to get nice even surfaces on there. Lots of redrifting of that eye after this, but that helps a lot. This is the smaller of the two ads, so it's not too far off, but I think it could have been longer. In either what case, it's still going to be a good usable tool. And I don't see any further sign of our weld opening up. So the next thing is, of course, to turn it back around and try and fix that eye I screwed up so bad. This is the usual routine. You do all the rough forging on the eye, but you still have to come back and straighten it later. Now when we fix this weld, we push some material in here, so I have to be a little bit careful not to get that real misshapen. I may get in there with a file before we're all done and clean it up that way. Looks like the eye's a little more open on the underside, so that's where I'm gonna start my drifting here. It's a lot better. Take one more heat and then I think it'll be filing or die grinding in there. And this time I'll come down from the top. I think we're going to drift this one more time after I do whatever cleanup I decide to do. I mostly want it straight before I get to that point. And I do think that's all I want to do with the drift right now. It wants to drift crooked because of how odd that went together. Or... So that cleans that eye up very nicely. Still has a little imperfection in there, but it's certainly not going to hurt anything. I still think I can get a little bit more stretch out of here and maybe a little spread there. Not a lot because it's getting kind of thin. I just like it to be a little closer to the size and shape of the one out of the book. I'm going to work over this big fuller here. Try and leave a nice smooth transition. Adds is also somewhat curved. Perhaps not that much. I'm going to see if I can spread that just a little bit more. Not getting much out of it, but just every little bit helps. I'm just going to use the cross pin and try to get some more spread here. Bring that back up to near welding heat again as I refine that. This is not the time I want to crack anything. That little bit just makes me a lot happier with it. I 
I think I'm going to dish it a little bit this way, give it some sweep, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the very end, why I decided to do that. I don't think the original was done that way. I think that's really all I need to do there. One last look at the eye, and I think we're done. Put my touch mark in it. I'm going to let this air cool and normalize again. And then I'm going to do a little grinding on the ears and make sure there's no cracks or open weld seams at the cutting edge. quench about the last inch, inch and a half. And I'm going to clean that up with a bit of brick here. See if I can see some tempering colors run. I'm not seeing any colors run there. So I'm just going to put the back end of this back in the fire. See if we can get the colors to run that way. I'm looking for kind of a bronze to peacock color there is about the temperature I want. And it's starting to move there, so I'm just going to watch it now. I don't know if you can see that in the camera at all. Probably not. Then let's go back to the water. Now I'm going to quench the whole thing. And there is our hardened and tempered ads head. This has been a very educational project so far. I don't do a lot of work in wrought iron. For those of you who are new here, I usually use mild steel, and it's just what I'm accustomed to. Wrought iron is a different material and requires a little bit different skill set in attention to some details that you don't usually think of in mild steel, like working it at a very high heat and not letting it get too cold. But I think this is going to be a successful tool. Everything behaved well during the quench. It's got those little flaws in there that I really don't think are going to hurt it. I'm going to go ahead and put a handle on it. I'm going to use it, do some carving with it. Now I talked about putting a little bit of a curve in here or a sweep like a gouge would have a sweep. And I did that because I typically use adzes for hollow forms. I do a little bit of green woodworking, bowl carving, spoon carving. Not a lot, but that's where I typically use an adze and that's where this one will most likely be used. Also out of habit, I always put the cutting edge on the inside because that's what fits best in that situation and that means you have to have an outside bevel and therefore it's it's still better for an ads being used on an inside surface. If I put the cutting edge on the outside that means the bevel would be on the inside then that would be better for planing a flat surface or hewing a flat surface like we're finding boards and things like that and I think the original was that way there's no indication it had this curve so I've gone off the map a little bit 
and I might make another one that is a little bit more faithful to the original, but I probably won't do a video on it, although there's a much bigger ads, and I will plan to do a video on that at some point in the future. What do you say we make a handle for this thing? I have a piece of oak. This is a brushy oak that grows around here. I don't know what kind of a handle it's going to make. I've never tried to make one out of it, but I thought we would give it a try today. So I wouldn't recommend gamble oak or scrub oak as a good carving wood. I suspect it's strong enough for a handle, but it's just cranky. Well, in the interest of time, I went ahead and took this up to the belt sander in the shop and finished cleaning that up. But you could do it all by hand if you want to take enough time to do it. And I would get better wood if you are. This has a lot of knots I didn't see. But I think it'll be okay for such a small tool. I've also cut cross wedges in here this direction because sometimes with forge welding, if you wedge too tight this way, you could start to open that weld up. I'm pretty comfortable this is a good weld. I'm not too worried about it. But it's not a bad idea to wedge it front to back instead. And I'm actually going to do it both ways. And I like to put just a little bit of wood glue on the wedges. And I also try to avoid steel wedges if I can. No big deal if you like them, but I'd just as soon not have them if I can avoid it. There we go. So now we're going to let all that mess dry. And then I'll trim it all off. Well, in spite of a few little rough spots during the forging, this really turned out to be a pretty darn good little ads. I think I'm going to be real glad to have it. 
I don't think I'll be doing too much hand carving of this scrub oak. It's awfully tough to work with. But in the long run, taking it to the belt sander did result in a decent little handle. And I like the geometry of this adds. It's going to be ideal for doing spoons and things like that. So all in all, I consider this a complete success. I do hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. If you would like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links down in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. Those are merely donations. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. Be safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.